reply to those, and then we take another session of three questions, okay? So, who wants to ask questions? Thank you very much. I think I enjoyed all the three presentations and fascinating, but I also see a lot of similarities and differences in terms of issues. So I have a question for Jerry. Um, you know, we, you, your topic is about population, quantity, quality, and mobility. So and then I think uh, it linked it to also the, our Brazilian presentation about the role of a labor market or somehow. So I, I, was, I was struck by your comment or your ev evidence from China about migration impact on child performance. So I don't know, because I'm also working in this area, because a lot of, lots of media and lots of people say left behind children are the ones who suffer from you know, migration or urbanization. But I would take a different view, because if you look at migration in China, that could be one of the single most important factors contributing to poverty alleviation in rural areas for the past three decades. And then, you know, when you look at, you know, people say they don't have parents to take care of being with them, but actually we did a study these days, and just last year we used, we put about 12,000 students' data, compared them whether they're le left behind children with a single parent at home or somehow. What we found is that none of the indicators we use re reflecting the left behind children are the worst. In fact, both parents are at home are the worst. So in terms of migrating, contributing to this, it's a mix that you have to consider other things because it relaxes the liquidity constraints. And also when you look at you know, in inequality, in fact the migration Contri initial migration contributed to enlarging inequality, but now 90% of households have people migrating, so it contributed to narrowing inequality. So when we comment on those, probably it would need to be stage-wise. When are you talking about migration? Because that linked to my other questions, uh, other actually question towards um, the three presentations. How much we can generalize from these three presentations where you know, we could learn and compare from each other, but because some are related to social security policies and some are related to macro general policies where I, I, I guess we're at the different stage of development, even there are similar characteristics. And then it'd be a unique opportunity we could compare those <coughs> stage-wise to say, you know, how, you know, when are we ever going to learn about our failure or success? This is the time that we could do. So I was trying to form my question, but it just mainly brainstorming and thinking, and also probably later on. But that, that's just uh, one of those. But another comment about the third kind of um, uh, presentation is, when I look at the education, school attendance in Brazil is exactly like China. So keeping kids in school right now is one of our biggest challenge in terms of finishing at least a decent high school education. So we are trying to learn from you, paying the poor families to keep their kids in school. Now you are telling me about the quality in schooling. So that there are many dimensions. If you fix one issue, you have another issue. So probably uh, we are looking at the same thing. We have not, we're trying to get 50% of the kids into vocational education, but the vocational education quality is so crappy and nobody learned anything. The gain, the incremental gain after year even minus, so, so that's something we're facing. So lots of similarities. I would propose we could do a country comparative studies even among this audience, you know, what, next year or something. Uh, sorry, it's a bit long, but it was, it brought to me a lot of thinking there. Yeah. 
That was actually quite smart move, Dr. Lin Xiu. You ask three questions at once. <laughs> but still I will ask for others <laughs> to have other questions, please. I can imagine that you have a difference in growth and poverty eradication uh, between rural and urban areas. Uh, could maybe both, all three of you make comments about that in your countries? And can I ask a second question, or I will go on to the second question since he's not paying attention. Um, the second question is, I can also, how does the geographical expansion uh, of the three countries, we know the comparison obviously, and the diversity of the resources that you have play a role in growth? Um, I said to my colleague, as a, to Andre, as a person coming from South Africa, I, I've come all the way to the jungle to find the answer to how Brazil achieved poverty reduction and a reduction in inequality. And the answer I heard was, we don't know. Um, so a few things came to mind. One is a fairly specific question, which I think I'd like to pose to Joe, is um, what about policies which attempt to deal with prenatal, um, improving prenatal care? So one of the things that we've been, we've, I've heard about that happens in, in Latin America are grants that are given to pregnant women to be able to improve the, the, the development of the child in the womb. And is there any experience with that from the, 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 the very extensive review that you did? The second question, which could be directed at anyone, are social, social protection policies that might have, that have attempted to deal with the catch-up of children that were stunted at birth, and whether there's any, uh, is there any evidence that suggests that catch up might be possible? I gather that there are a few papers that are now starting to argue that. Um, and then the last question is just a comment to Aya. I mean, I, I found your presentation one of the most remarkable I've heard in a long time. I, I really had not considered poverty in a country such as Japan, and I think it, it was a rather bleak presentation, but I, I, I think we should learn a lot from what you did. And uh, I think the idea of the, this comparative study between perhaps countries like Brazil, South Africa, China, and drawing on lessons of developed countries would be a very nice thing to come out of this, out of this workshop. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the first one. Uh, thanks for the good questions and answer uh, a few of them and leave the others for my colleagues here. Uh, first, and uh, I, uh, uh, we should uh, exchange our, our, our studies. Uh, what we find is comparing the counterfactual in terms of learning that children are better or worse off. There may be other ways in which they're better off, but in terms of how they perform on exams, they're, they're worse off. Uh, but, so it's not a question of how they compare with other people, but whether those same children will be better or worse. Uh, but we should uh, uh, discuss that more. In regard to your question about you know, how much can we generalize, I, I, I feel a lot of tension on that, and I'll be interested in seeing what my colleagues say in that question. Uh, I think context is really important, and that we want to try hard to learn what we can from other countries. But I think in terms of learning what's likely to happen in any one country, uh, we have to be very careful to adjust what we learn from other countries. I think that's true for policies as, as well, very uh, uh, true for uh, policies. Um, let me jump to uh, at least one of uh, Julian's questions. Um, the, there, there is a strong view out there that life ends at 24 months. Uh, there's well-known papers. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in Cesar Victoria's country, I, and he's not here to defend himself, and he's a friend. Uh, but uh, he heads a group uh, that has papers in Lancet Pediatrics, which has literally such uh, phases as... as uh, uh, Malnutrition as of 24 months is irreversible. Now, irreversible sounds pretty definitive. Uh, certainly, we've been, I'm in, involved with maybe some of the studies to which you're referring, in which uh, we find a fair amount of evidence of changes after uh, 24 months in both directions, which I think is important. There's substantial uh, catch up and there's substantial faltering. Uh, and uh, 
I think that's important because life is not over 24 months. There may be options to do something after that. Uh, and presumably, if what really counts is your status, say, when you're eight years old, then you have to worry about the faltering, not just where you were at, at 24 months. And we find that if you look at the association, uh, at least, between uh, your cognitive status at age eight and your physical uh, stature, uh, it's the same whether or not you caught up or you never were behind. So that seems to at least raise questions uh, about that, and I'd be glad to talk more with you about that. I think the one question that was raised to me was, the, you know, because of the different geographical uh, locations and different resource allocations, can you really compare these countries? And, uh, <coughs> And of course, this, uh, there are a lot of differences between Brazil and Japan and in China and so forth. So you cannot really compare. But I, I do think that, that this demographic change is something that we do. We should really think of something that we can all share. And uh, because of coming from a country where the aging, population aging is most advanced in all over the world, I do not think many of the people realize how big a problem this is. Um, we are beginning to see that uh, a lot of uh, the working age, prime aged men are forced to quit work because they have to take care of their parents at home. <laughs> because they don't have, um, he, if he doesn't get married, then he doesn't have a spouse to take care of his, uh, you know, his uh, elderly parents. In here. And he would have to quit his work to take care of elderly parents. <laughs> and uh, just this morning, on a, on a TV in my hotel, I was show, seeing some Japanese news, and they are saying that now they have to uh, care for the dementia people in the prisons because uh, so they have to line up all this work for dementia people because uh, because they cannot do the regular kind of work that all the other prisoners do, and because the aging is now in the in the prisons as well. So it really he changes everything in your society, and uh, I think. Um, this impact is something that you should, um, that we can all share, and then we can all learn from each other. I'll try to make a, one one comment for for each one regarding China. Is exactly, I think that this is a similarity with China, right? as you say. The first. Uh, 1992 was the first year in Brazil where more than 90% of a seven-year-old cohort were enrolled in school. That figure were reached almost 100 years before in many other countries. And of course, to reach that, we did many things like many children in classroom having uh, formally four hours a day. So. Uh, a school day would work at, in 12 hours, uh, uh, from 7 to 12, from 7 to 11, one class, another class 11 to 3, and etc. So we started like that, and of course it it uh, it reflects in the quality, and that that's our our main 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 issue here. But an another point is what do you do with the the young adult worker now, which it reached the labor market not very well qualified, and then the vocational training is, is an important issue. And, now, and we, we have a couple of, of studies here in Brazil seeing this effect on, on vocational training in Brazil. And we do find some positive impacts on, on, on getting jobs or even a, a, a higher earnings, et cetera, but, but not, not quite sizable. And it's a short-run effect. If some studies, like, I don't know, the Hanushek study recently that show that long-run impacts does not work. So I don't know if you should spend too much time, too, too much money on, on vocational. But in Brazil, it also is, is, is a hot debate on that. Vocational training, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I don't, don't want, uh, there, there, there is a lot of issues on where you spend money in Brazil on education, etc. But I want to go to resource diversity, as you mentioned, which is, this is a, 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 a crucial issue. It's not exactly, I think, how diverse it is, etc. But how, 
given a, a, a di diversity of, of resource, how this relates to the institutions in the country that relates to how to use it and how these resources are, you know, the, the, the properties of this the, uh, and the, the incomes that comes from this distributed, et cetera. The designing of this institution is very important to the effect of, of prospects of growth, et cetera. So uh, I, I, I'm not much expert this, but I, I know two studies in Brazil for a particular situation, which I think is very, very symptomatic of if you don't design well the policy, it can go wrong. We have a particular policy here in Brazil of distribution of royalties from oil. And, and it, 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 it's a very curious law which says that if there is a, a well on, the, on sea, a deep, deep sea, right? And, and so the, the municipality on the coast can get a share of that royalties for certain criteria of imaginary lines, perpendicular lines, and perpendicular, and, and perpendicular to the coast, and, and, and parallel to the equatorial line. So I don't know why that, that's a law. It's very curious law. But it's good for, the, for many, many empirical economists that use this change in this, this law to try to get some exogenous variation of who gets royalty and who don't, does not get. And the results, there are two, two good studies on that, that they show, I didn't, I didn't do that, but they, they, they found that those that got royalties grew less, the municipalities that got the royalties grew less, has more public servants, and spend less in health and education. So having the resource in itself can be a bonus, but depends how you design the policy to use it, can be actually a curse. With, there is a huge literature on that. But anyway, so this just to make the point that you should be smart how to use this resource. And, re and just to the last point of, uh, of South Africa, uh, you, you said the population bonus, et cetera. Yeah, pro probably that, that can explain part of Brazilian, Brazilian growth, right? And, and why we, we don't know what, what could explain exactly the things uh, of the reduction of poverty. I'll give you one thing that I am particularly uh, involved with, which is studying the decline of the child labor in Brazil. Uh, just a brief story quickly. I did my PhD dissertation in, in beginning of 2000, child labor in Brazil, using figures in the beginning of 90, which is very high, 30% of 14 years old male used to work in Brazil. And it went down by 10%, but went down to 10%. And what, steady decline of child labor in Brazil as well. And I said, well, what explained that? And you tried, oh, the change in law, we didn't find any effect, or effect of that. Uh, name it, we're trying to look many other things and you didn't find, you could not single out one, one particular element could explain the reduction. If there was one, what associated with that was the increasing of the education of their parents. Younger parents, more educated, child less likely to, to work, but this is a correlation. My point is, Many things happened, and many leading towards that as a consequence, having lower child labor incidence. But was all this together that perhaps led to this result? But you cannot single out one, one factor in itself that could broadly explain that. This for child labor, perhaps, I, I'm just conjectures here, perhaps this for poverty and many other things as well. Thank you very much. I am from India. Uh, all three presentations were very exciting. I was really, although it's not my field of specialization, still I enjoyed all these three presentations. My specific questions uh, are to Dr. Andre. Because in all your presentations, you compared so many countries, and I could see only at in one instance you compared India. Had it not been a good idea to compare India, China, and Brazil, and then see how these things are moving? Because I can see a lot of similarity in, in Brazilian and Indian economy as how these are growing. Uh, my second question is, uh, uh, or maybe you can throw some light on these issues. Uh, I couldn't understand why uh, Ease of school going children is increasing in, in, in Brazil. What could be the reason? Number two, have you ever seen school dropouts? Number three, is there any study in Brazil in which uh, 
girls, students, they are going in agriculture sector or not. I can tell you a very interesting uh, uh, studies from India, which even I have seen during my career. 20 years back, hardly 2 to 5 percent girls, students were there in agriculture, universities. Now trend is reverse. <laughs> After these 20 years, if you go to any agriculture university, 70 to 75 percent students are girls. So how this trend is changing and is, are you finding similar situations in Brazil or maybe in other countries? Thank you very much. Um, I see this conference having two parallel tracks. One is around where poverty is going. And the other one is around what we do about eradicating it through sustainable development, which is essentially tomorrow's discussion. But what I've learned from the last two days, but particularly this afternoon, is that poverty is increasing, not decreasing. It's not necessarily increasing in Brazil, but I'm not sure Andre and really talked that statistics are very dangerous things. When you have high percentages on low bases, it's not quite as fancy as it looks. And low percentages on high bases is quite a lot of money. And what we're finding is that in the world generally, inequality is becoming a major scourge. It's been raised by the UN, it's been raised by Obama, it's now a dominant feature of the Eurozone, and it's certainly plaguing Britain. And what inequality is doing is actually impoverishing people systematically. And what's more important is impoverishing people who are not used to being impoverished. It's one thing when you're poor, um, and you suffer, and I don't want to get any impression that I accept that that is something we should tolerate, quite the reverse. But when you're not poor and you start suffering, you make an awful lot of fuss. And that's what's happening throughout the Western world. And it doesn't look it's going to change for another five years and maybe even more. And Aya's uh, presentation, which I thought was outstanding, shows us what I call a shot across the brows. This is what countries could look like. And ask yourself three questions. What does this mean, first of all, for the notion of social cohesion? If people are now being forced out of their normal way of living and having a family, having a house, having a job, having what we heard this morning was called basic well-being. If you take that away from people, give them no chance, what do they think, number one? Two, what does that mean for democracy? For people actually having a faith in a collective identity called a polity? I'm not sure that that necessarily holds together. And you weaken the capacity of society to hold together. But the third question, which is the whole point of me standing up, what does this mean for sustainability? Because if you actually raise the question in your mind, what it's doing is making people exceptionally short-term in their thinking. It's making them very high consumerists in order to gratify what they're facing up to. Often really perverse consumption, but nevertheless still consumption. And above all, it's creating a feeling that why should we care about apes in Rwanda or penguins in the Antarctic? Why should we care about that? That's not the way my life is being treated right now. This lack of decency of treatment means that why should we be decent to nature? Now, I'm arguing this is actually a scientific investigation of some significance. What's happening to people's mindsets? when they're confronted with the kind of evidence we're seeing on this table this morning, this afternoon. So part of the debate I feel for this meeting, and I congratulate my Brazilian host on taking the lead here and having this on the agenda for the academies, is that sustainability is itself threatened by increasing poverty. Then tomorrow we start another set of questions. What do we do about trying to eradicate all this, including what's called the new poverty as well as we call the existing poverty, because there are two categories of poverty now, and we have to address them both in the context of sustainability, but it's not the same set of answers, but it's the same drive from you in the Brazilian Academy that you've given us to this opportunity to discuss them. So I'd like to ask my friends on the platform, what's this mean in what you're giving us for sustainability and sustainable development? Yeah, I have uh, a quite naive question, so sorry for that. How is poverty defined? is that, let's say, below a certain percentage of middle income. So then, of course, poverty in Germany uh, is quite different from poverty, for example, in Nigeria, and uh, also linked with, um, let's say, food security. So I think um, food security uh, for people counted to be poor in Germany 
is still granted in contrast uh, to food security for people counted to be poor in Nigeria or maybe also in China. So I think uh, it will be good to a little bit elaborate on these definitions. So uh, let me uh, respond a bit to the last two interventions. Uh, clearly the definition is critical and if you have a definition that's a proportion of the medium which may be very useful for some reasons, um, it doesn't address what you might think of it as absolute poverty. The you know, World Bank has attempted with all its warts on it, to use a constant definition across countries of less than a dollar and a quarter, less than two dollars a day. By that definition, you know, a billion people have moved out of, of extreme poverty, I mean, I, I call it extreme, extreme poverty in the past two decades. You know, that's, that's amazing. That's never happened before. Likewise, in regard to inequality, it depends on what your unit is. If one looks at the uh, world, uh, you know, for world citizens, inequality has fallen in the last two decades. Median income has gone up a lot more than mean income. Median income in the world has gone up 43 uh, percent. You know, that's more than mean income, so I don't know, so I want to get median versus mean, but you know, world inequality has fallen even though in most countries, and Brazil is a notable exception, inequality within countries have increased. And that's you know, very easy to reconcile, I think. Uh, you know, you've had primarily the uh, Chinese and Indian just in terms if you count a person as a person, so they really wait a lot. And in those two countries, there's been increasing inequality, but the whole distribution has moved closer to the European, North American distribution, enough that world inequality has fallen. So um, that may not help if one feels all that is relevant is one's own country. Uh, but you know, for a group like this, I guess I would hope that we would be concerned about the global distribution as well as the distribution within countries. And they move in different directions in the past decade or two. Um, first about um, the definition, I think Professor Berman has, has elaborated enough, but um, the definition by the European Union or uh, the OECD's um, uh, relative uh, poverty rate definition is about how that person fares in that society. So obviously for $2 a day in Japan, you, can, you might be able to survive with scavenging garbages, but you will not be <laughs> presentable, you will not be able to function as a member of the society uh, with that. And for, that, for someone to be able to function as a member of society, to associate with others, to interact and to have family and to go to school and have jobs and to go to vote. And that's, not being able to do that is considered to be related to poverty. And I think that is, uh, leads to the question of what uh, Professor Tim has said about inequality as well. And it is, as damaging to a person as, as absolute poverty, I feel. It's, it's, the, um, it's like having a child who cannot pay school lunch meal fees, so he had to bring a rice bowl to school. And he will not starve, and he might be even getting all the nutrients, but he will be really isolated, and he will be excluded from his, his child community. And um, that, uh, we use the term social exclusion in, you know, in EU terms, but that is uh, that kind of, uh, of deprivation, sense of deprivation really leads to the, the question that leads into sustainability. Like that kind of person who grew up feeling like that would not care about, about his neighbor or the penguins in Antarctica or anything. He would really want to just make his living. And also he, that will lead to also instability within society and there's a lot of uh, 
<coughs> research going on, uh, mainly by Wilkinson and so forth, about how inequality is relating to the abusiveness within society or people's perception of, uh, of uh, racism and, uh, and such that. So I think inequality, I think, is a very big issue and relative uh, poverty is also something that I would like to be um, on the agenda. We used here the absolute poverty and the head count of it. So fix a poverty line and the proportion of people below that. But there is a, 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 a huge literature on that, how to measure the selection of the dimensions. So just to be brief, here we, I select, and I think we, we did, to select one dimension, income, and I, I used a absolute poverty line and choose a relative one. So I use a fixed value of, the, of income, and there are many ways to how to select this one. I pick the one that is the, if the family per individual has enough income to buy food that would, the, the basket of food that had the amount of calories enough to not be undernourished. So that was a very specific, but there are many ways you, you can construct these lines, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to enter in this digression now, but you're right. I think this is, this is an important issue to, to, to bring about and, and, and discuss, and, or at least make clear when you're presenting. So just to make clear, was income dimension an absolute one. So it's not much very comparable our results because you're not using the same line. Okay, so if you want to compare across countries, then you would be to have a good, a good line as the World Bank uses, and the figures I used here when I compared countries were using a single line by the World Bank was $2 a day. So that's why India had that big figures there. And, and India don't, don't, correct me if I write, but India don't like much that figure, so India has its own poverty line to, to measure the, the policy. But the, the thing point is it's important for the policies that you have targets and then you can measure how your, your policies are doing and compare the situation. Anyway. So I'll skip to the, the first question. If I, if I'm, if I don't answer all, all of them, please, please uh, uh, tell me. Uh, first, the dropout. If, if, it, if we have dropouts, that was your question, right? Uh, we, we, we have dropout, particularly for adolescents, when they are reaching high school. So 15 to 18 years old, then start our dropout. We had before, uh, years before have for younger ones, not now. What happens now for the, for the primary educated ages, primary educated kids, we have lots of delay. So take, take a while to finish. So just to give one figure, all kids that started seven years old in Brazil now, for, uh, six years old now, the, the first year of primary education, they end after eight years, only half of them are in the correct grade, okay? And if, and, and same figures, and even if this half one that started high school, only half finish in the correct age. So actually, one cohort in Brazil now that start, if, if this remains, we have w one out of four that we will reach college eight at 18 years old, nowadays in Brazil. So we have problems on all, all this delay going out, et cetera. Regarding girls, actually Brazil is one of the, one of the countries that the, the figures for girls are better than for boys. We have higher school attendance for less delay for girls. Uh, 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 what else? We, all, 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 all the measures of, of, of education you, we, we, we obtain, we have better figures for girls than for boys. Proficiency, that is not, is not the case for math, but is the case for Portuguese. But by the way, this is true for all PISA, most of the countries that use PISA exams, girls is better in language, has higher scores in language than boys and boys has higher scores in math than girls. God knows why, but anyway, so you, you follow that as the word. Uh, there is one single thing for girls which strikes me, we have been documented in many studies for Brazil, is the case that older girls in a family are the ones that has less education attainment related to younger girls and younger boys. We still do have it. So there is some, some birth order effects within families still in, in, in Brazil. 
Regarding uh, then the study of China, India, and, uh, and Brazil, actually, there are some, some movements toward that. The, the first study I showed when I tried to, to see what, what are the immediate factors related to income growth in Brazil by, by income, parts of, by part of income distribution, actually was a study that was done in a, in a, in a meet, for a meeting with South Africa and India with the, the democratic BRICS that want to, to get common things, what can learn to each other. So there is already some movements at, at least at institutions and academia trying to, to convey some, some learnings of, of this. I don't know if that was your question, but anyway. And finally, social cohesion and, and, uh, and sustainability, right? I think that's why I, I care somehow about inequality. I think we should care more of poverty, of course, that at least my, my, my subjective welfare function for the society. You know? But uh, inequality has this, the, this point that can, if it's a highly unequal society, it can actually uh, uh, challenge the social cohesion of that society. And, and so how you bring about that social cohesion, it, it, it's an important issue. It doesn't mean that I don't know how to do it, I don't know how to do it. But anyway, I think it, it's an important issue to, to scientists look at it carefully to avoid some disruptions or right, more situations. Maybe my question is the same about the sustainability that has not been replied and that we notice. <laughs> because after uh, listening to you and to all the previous uh, panels, uh, I think that, he, and, no, and notably the, the uh, uh, presentation from uh, Japan in which uh, we have been saying or we have been believing that through economic development we are going to improve the world. But it turns out that no. I, I just learned today that if you're a developing country, you want to be an emerging country and then you want to be a develop, developed country because then poverty and everything will be perfect. So this is not true. We are going that pathway and things are not there. So something we are doing wrong we see from the, all the areas that we are doing something wrong. So what we are going to propose is this concept of sustainability, uh, just a concept or what? So I think that you need to reply to the question. If uh, my uh, calculations are not mistaken, uh, 2014, it makes about 30 years since the Brundtland report which was, I believe, in 1984, is that correct? The Brundtland Report. Okay, Third, three decades have gone by, and uh, we have, uh, since the, the Brundtland Report, we have uh, heard a lot and discussed a lot about the inadequacy of monetary indicators for well-being, GDP, there are alternative indicators, and so on. And frankly, three, three decades after the Brundtland Report, which alarmed the world about the sustainability issue, it is uh, a bit deceiving uh, to see that uh, poverty issues are still addressed in terms, merely in terms of monetary income. What about access to public goods? Uh, we, we heard that uh, despite the progress in Brazil, there are still uh, great problems in supplying education of uh, adequate quantity and quality, not to mention health. And what about urban security or other insecurity? Uh, I just wonder whether, well, usually what you think is when uh, uh, social inequality uh, uh, diminishes, uh, urban violence should also diminish. Uh, to my knowledge and my feeling of uh, uh, someone who lives in Brazil, this is not quite the case. Uh, we have statistics of urban violence uh, which are uh, not very different from a country at war. 
uh, in Brazil, uh, not to mention uh, violence in the fields, uh, agrarian conflicts, uh, uh, which uh, are particularly uh, high uh, here in the Amazon region. I mean, I, I feel that there, there really should be an effort to integrate other dimensions uh, otherwise, uh, we, we, I mean, we risk of uh, looking uh, the, at, the, at the, the wrong things, and uh, we want where, uh, um, and probably we have an illusion that things are getting better, uh, but uh, they really are not. Um, you know, this is just what I wanted to comment. Thank you. So, straight to to your point. Uh, there are many other dimensions that can be considered, and you're right, and actually the, the literature on poverty index discusses exactly that. Uh, there is the index of multidimensional poverty that exactly is, is a theoretical discussion. Which dimensions should I, I want to consider? This, of course, is a choice of the, the analyst, so and actually it's a, it's a, at the end is a matter of judgment which, which Dimensions should I consider that I want to consider, etc. I want to reflect my own judgment. I want to reflect society's judgment, etc. So it's, 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 a, it's a normative discussion, actually, and an important one that should be openly discussed. You're right. And we have, we, we have figures for multidimensional poverty in Brazil for many different dimensions. And, and depending on the dimensions you, you pick, usually most of the combination of dimensions that are measurable in our data, etc., there is a reduction in poverty, some more or less, etc. I showed here only the dimension of income because I want to make the point of this, the, the role of the labor market and relate to demographics and income, etc. But you're right, it, it's a matter of our society judgment or the correct correct uh, dimensions or what dimension should be in, what the weight of dimension you do. So there, there are, there are not, it's not tricky yeah? because one thing is look at, for instance, what clear dimension, income, and then you know what 10% increase of that thing is. But imagine when you bun we put together a bunch of different things with different dimensions, different measure, unit of measures, et cetera, et cetera, and then you have a single index and then this single index went up 10%, what does it mean? So. There is, but there is a, a, a fruitful and rich literature right on that with many, many, many writers that have discussed that. Uh, so it's there, it's there. I, uh, what I can say to you here is that I chose the, the one dimension because I want to emphasize that. And, and the people that, and I did myself, but the people that constructed multidimensional Poverty index, or even the Human Development Index, is an aggregate of three dimensions: health, education, and income. As well, this measure for Brazil also shows shows improvement. It does not mean that Brazil has not improved. Violence, in many cases, ha, 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 has has deteriorated in many regions. But actually, the aggregate data on homicides in Brazil has gone down. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, I think I think that's it. There was there was another question. Or? Oh, that's the hard one. Uh, <laughs> well, I think the answer is the same, though. <laughs> you know, there are efforts to, well, I feel schizophrenic because um, I think, um, actually, I think if you're incredibly poor, whether or not you have $2 a day is a big deal. You know, I don't, I don't think that's something that should be ignored. Um, I also think that other dimensions, as Andres mentioned, uh, as in a way, you know, sustainability, but different dimensions of, of, of access to services, et cetera, are a very important part of, of life. And this may relate to uh, social tension in long ways that have been measured. Um, and so, you know, part of me says, this is why I'm schizophrenic, you know, that we would like this index which incorporates many things like this. Uh, it gets hard to construct, hard to interpret. Um, and, you know, the other side of me says, well, if you just 
look at per capita income because due to Kuznets or someone 80 years ago, that's measured widely across the world and you can make comparisons. Or you can make comparisons in life expectancy widely across the world, people have. Uh, then you're clearly focusing upon one dimension of the many dimensions of life that are relevant. Uh, so I didn't answer anyone's question, but I reflected my schizophrenia. I guess this sort of brings me back. I didn't quite understand your question earlier, Kevin. I didn't ignore it. I did. I didn't respond to it, but I, it was because I wasn't sure what you were asking. You were asking about. Geographical. No, the, her question I thought had to do with geography and diversity, sustainability over here. But I miss. Am I missing something? Or I'm sorry. You want to repeat the question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. The but size not make only a difference. Geographical um, space, but the diversity that that offers in, re in resources. Mm. And so, resources obviously play a really big role in development and uh, eradication of poverty mm. in, in a right way, which you did uh, uh, yeah. contribute a lot to. Okay, thanks for uh, expanding on it. Um, Sorry to bring us back to this with a question, but I, I felt I was sitting here, we were yeah. chatting, and you know, I, we had, no one had an attempted to answer it. I think it also is a tricky question. First, I think resources are not always the best thing going. You know, Botswana has done incredibly well with diamonds. Most countries that have diamonds, you know, it's maybe because of the social fa fabric or whatever. It's been a source of disaster. It's been a source of you know, blood wars. You know, Liberia, you know, South Africa has had been that bad <laughs> for sure. But uh, uh, I, I, I think of, of many of the poorer countries, you know, which of the oil countries have really done well in, in the past two decades? Maybe Indonesia? If we if we if we count Brazil as an oil country now, <laughs> but that's more looking well, forward. Look but back. you know, it, it's 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 not it's not clear that you know Norway has done well, uh, getting outside the developing countries. Uh, but many of the countries that are rich in natural resources have had great difficulties. Uh, maybe because that brings in certain international relations, international uh, foreign direct investment, which ends up not benefiting the country. All right, but there's you know, a whole literature on the so-called well, Dutch disease because the Dutch blew it first with natural resources. So but we, we, didn't want, <laughs> we didn't want you to think we ignored completely your question. We were just trying to figure out if we understood it. Yeah, OK, thanks. Oh. Well, one thing, um, I, I think among the economists, there's a real um, development about um, coming up with the different ways from besides the GDP to uh, see the uh, wellness, well-being of a nation, um, starting with the Stiglitz reports, which came out last year or the year before. Uh, so I think there are a lot of developments going on in that area in academia. And uh, I just wanted to comment one thing about uh, from this uh, lady. And I just said that Japan is a failure. And I, I, I do not say that all the developed countries as a, as a failing. And uh, I do think that many of the European countries, especially like Northern European countries, and uh, maybe someone from Sweden can say something, but <laughs> or Denmark, uh, they were the happiest country in the world in, in all of the indicators, <laughs> are doing, uh, doing pretty well. But uh, um, I do think that Japan is a pretty and bad uh, example, and mainly because it's not sustainable, and we have already hit the deadlock. And I do think that that, that says something. And I'm not really sure, though, that the other uh, countries that are following Japan now uh, can 
go into the European model because the Europeans had went through the demographic change long, long before us and with a lot, a lot more time span than, longer time span than we are, we did. So I don't know if they can be served as the model, but I'm, I'm saying, just saying that uh, not all the countries are failures. <laughs> I just want to think because I, I, feel, I feel uncomfortable not giving at least one, one uh, answer to you, although I don't think if I have a good answer to you, but I don't want to live. Yeah, I, anyway, first, uh, uh, I, I don't want to discuss philosophically what sustainability is, but actually I think what, what aspect of, of sustainability we, we are talking about. I think here there is one aspect that's clear that and maybe commonly across countries and experience, which is the fact of the, the sustainability, or let's say, of intergenerationally transfers that we, with our social security systems, etc., we are imposing on society, or we society as a whole chose it. So we already chose how much you're gonna tax my, the sons of my sons. We already chosen how much it's going to be transferred from old and young when they when they're young now going to be old, etc. And we know that, of course, if we 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 produce certain amount of of, of income or you know, and then we're going to transfer among people and among generations, the rules are set now, and you know demographics are changing. We know that rules will not be sustainable because there will be huge transfers among generations, and actually you are making choices now, even for generations that haven't been born, and gonna be at some point met there in the future. And so this is, I think, a very serious problem to be tackled now, of our, how we redesign our social security policies, our social protections, etc. In that regard, I think we are already discussing it. See? And, and, and I think the, 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 the lessons from Japan and the message from Japan, it's really eye-opening for, for countries like us, that they're still in the population bonus, and we know we have a rule and a set of institutions that can be met now with sacrifice, but can be met now because of the population bonus, but probably will not be met in the future. And now we have time and opportunity to adjust in, and not be too much, let's say, painful if we wait for this adjustment in the 20 or 30 years from now. But anyway, it's not exactly what you mean, but at least it's a, a flavor of it. Anyway, thank you. So let me give another non-answer. <laughs> so there's a, a famous book that you may know or fam uh, by Julian Simon called The Ultimate Resource. There was a famous bet that you probably uh, are aware of between uh, Ehrlich and Simon about what's going to happen to commodity prices over the next 10 years. Ehrlich was saying the world's coming to an end, you're know, running out of commodities. So they basically placed a bet, and uh, I forget, thousand dollars or whatever it was, uh, about whether uh, commodity prices would go up or down in 10 years. They went down, Simon won the bet. Uh, but Simon's book on the ultimate resource is arguing the ultimate resource is people. And if you want to sustain society, what you want to do is invest in, in people. And that people have shown an incredible capacity for adjusting to all sorts of changes. And Simon, I'm speaking on behalf of Simon who has passed away. Uh, I think he would not disagree with this, these statements that uh, people have uh, adapted amazingly to changes and there's no reason to think they will not continue to and the real important part of the Brazilian story may be the part that Andres didn't place the central stage. He talked somewhat about education, talked a little bit about health and nutrition, but there's been really impressive improvements in investments in people in Brazil in the past 10 years. Well, congratulations for all three. I like it too much. And um, one thing that I, I'm thinking about is that uh, most of the countries that are developed are also democratic ones. And most of the not uh, more poor 
are um, have uh, dictatorial um, governors and uh, a lot of corruption also involved. Okay, well now we have some cases of corruption also here, but but we we see uh, in mainly Latin American countries that the things start to be, um, uh, getting better when democratic government uh, started to rule all countries and then we see the uh, not only growth but also the distribution of uh, incomes and professor andre uh, shows so the transfer of uh, the incomes is the most important part not only uh, growth but um, uh, so how can the united nations if there is some way to force by tried the market to um, help these countries to um, to change the governors to to really not by wars of course but to, by the, uh, the the trade market i think that is the only uh, corner the, the only way to force because uh, if not talking, but uh, by, um, by the trade market, uh, how do you think it can help, it can work? Thank you. Okay. No, I think this is a very important question. Very serious. And actually, there is a literature on, on that as, among economists. Uh, I, but I, I'm, I'm not specialized exactly on this. There, there are lots of studies trying to, to see how institutions, how democracy affects growth, etc., and actually very interesting one. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, well-versed in, 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 this, in this literature. I will, I will, just to not leave you without an answer again, uh, I'll give you one, one uh, interpretation of my reading for Brazil case of an interesting book by an economic historian called Growing Public by... Peter Lindert, is Peter the first name? Lindert of University of UC Davis. A very a great book. He's an economic historian that is, uh, he studies the, the evolution of social policies in, in European countries, France, England, and 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 the, and the United States, etc. Why I'm saying this book? Because he shows the following correlation, which is very interesting. Uh, just for education, for instance, when a country reached universal coverage of schooling for kids, where when a country have universal enfranchisement, people voting, and 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 actually, it was a very interesting chapter I had in that book. I don't know if it's coincidentally, but Brazil could be a point in that data that he did the regression. Because Brazil had the universal enfranchise, universal voting for, in our constitution in 1888, professor, when we allowed illiterate people to vote, it was in 1988. Until then, illiterate people could not vote in Brazil. And by then, we have a big, a sizable share of adult population illiterate in Brazil. And from 1988, well, 881, they were allowed to vote. Not obliged as we are, but voting in Brazil is mandatory. <laughs> and, and, and illiterate ones were not mandatory, but they were now they could vote. Coincidentally, four years later, the first time seven years old kids, 9% of them were enrolled in school. So exactly similar to what happened to the data that Professor Lindert had for France, England, and, and, and US. So there is something related to participation, voice, and, and then open access to, to education, health, and, and development. So if, if, you, if you have, it's a good reading for, for Christmas time, by the way. Well, <clears throat> that's definitely not my area of expertise. But I just would like to make a quick comment on that. Uh, you know, essentially what you, what you pointed out is what can be done for other nations to maybe convince their governments. And of course, I mean, you really don't think about force. And I think 
The only thing that really can be done are examples. In every country, what people want, they want to have a good life, they want to be able to feed their kids, they want to be able to, to have access to some goods. And I think they, for, for some things, it just takes time. There's, there's a reason why Europe is overall better off than most of South American countries. There's a reason for that. So just, just, just as a comment, I think that the best thing, and actually the only thing that can be done, in my opinion, when it comes with issues with government, you know, is only giving examples. And promote freedom, freedom of access, so people can know how everything is, how, how, how other populations are dealing with their daily lives. I think that's, that's the best thing that we can do, and time. So with this, I resume the session. I would like to thank everyone uh, for the speakers and also for you to have made some excellent questions. And, and I will always remind you, you're gonna, everyone that has provided a talk will receive an email from us. We really would like to publish uh, uh, the presentations that you gave here. So thank you very much, and with this, I close the session.